Steve. Welcome to the forums. Thank you. All right, so you're going to have access to this when I get done. So what I'm going to try to do is just to hit the highlights and then leave some comfortable time for questions afterward. And I think that um, anybody that wants to can get a hold of me later on if there's some deep issue that you want me to explore. So, so here we go, soils for your garden and containers. This is your best reference, and maybe your county agent uh, has access to that, and it's really important. One of the things to consider when you're putting out any kind of a garden is that don't just stick it in the corner someplace where maybe the grass won't grow needs and so putting it in a, a decent soil is a good first start and some soil testing especially in areas in our state for salts uh, is a good first step to being a success so a good garden soil needs some firmness for the supports of the plant it has to have the ability to hold water and we're holding on for a second sorry we lost your screen share. oh no All right, we back on? All right. has to have the ability to hold water, but on the other hand, it has to have good drainage, too, and the two are not, it's not an oxymoron. You can do, you can have a soil that does both, and that's your goal. It has to have the ability to exchange air because roots breathe, and so it has to have air down there. All soil is made up of minerals of different sizes, or organic, organic material. That makes up about half of the soil volume. The other half is the pore space. And there has to be air and water in that for the plants to do well. Minerals are sized as sand and silt and clay, with the sand the largest and the clay the smallest. And they're arranged by soil scientists in what we call a textural triangle. And if you want to read this, the left hand edge is the clays and bottom is the sands and the, the other side is the silts and then you just you read the read the percents over for example of soil that's a third and a third and a third uh, would be classified in in the middle there as a clay loam something that's a little bit more sandy would be classified as a loam So a forgiving, easy to work with soil with good natural drainage uh, is a soil that would be in the texture class of a loam to a sandy loam on the loamy side. And fortunately for most people in North Dakota, for most of the area of the state, uh, many, many gardens have uh, soil that's in this category. Um, unfortunately, those of us in Fargo, Grand Forks, and most of what we call the Red River Valley are in some really high clay soils, and we have some issues from time to time. But those of you, Valley City, Jamestown, Bismarck, different places, you're already blessed with some loam and sandy loam soils, so, so you're kind of ahead of the game. Don't forget the organic component of a soil, because soil is a biological creation. It isn't uh, just invented in the absence of biology. It has to have biology for it to make it. The minerals by themselves don't make a soil. The soils are alive, and you have to keep that in mind. If they're not alive, the productivity is going to be low, and you're, you're going to be, well, you're either going to be disappointed with the results, or you're going to have to manage them really, really intensely to get all the productivity that you should out of them. Here are some organic inputs. Uh, you can use fresh manure. It's highest in nitrogen, but if you're in town someplace, uh, maybe your neighbors would object to that nice beef cattle smell that comes from your garden. So be really, really careful of that. The other thing is, is that too high a rate of a, of a fresh manure can injure seeds and seedlings because they release quite a bit of ammonia. And so it's, it's often really not the greatest thing to do unless you Let's you do it early in the spring, perhaps, and then work it into the soil. And uh, an area that's not close to uh, neighbors that are offended easily. Composted manure and compost in general is a good source of nutrients, slow release, slow degradation. And it's a really good source of biology. Uh, if you go online and search for compost manure, a lot of times you come up with sterilized compost. And I suppose if you're going to grow mushrooms in the basement, that's a good thing. 
And uh, maybe if you're putting it on for some seedlings coming out of the ground, that's not a bad thing uh, in a greenhouse. But, but in a garden, the compost itself, sterilization is, is not recommended because you want the biology that's in the compost. Compost usually has, if it has a smell, it's a very mild smell because it's a pretty decomposed material. If it's, if it's, if it's composted correctly, the heat of the composting process itself will be enough to kill weed seedlings and nasty pathogens. So knowing the source of your compost is important as well. And if you maintain your own compost pile, uh, going through and uh, not neglecting it and making sure it's moist enough but not too moist is uh, is important try to try to try to create that heat but don't catch your house on fire another organic amendment that i think is important is sphagnum peat moss uh, in my mind it's a renewable resource if it's cultivated correctly it has really excellent water holding capacity it's particularly important for containers non-self-watering containers because it holds water like crazy. It aids in aeration, it doesn't have any smell, and it also concludes some of that biology that I think is important to make a good soil. This is an example of peat broad, peat bog. If you go up to northern Minnesota, if you're vacation in parts of Wisconsin, you'll see some of these, and they're really pretty interesting places. They're, they're little lakes that have kind of, uh, what, they've, they've silted in. And uh, and this and when you walk on them, it's like walking on a waterbed. But anyway, that peat is alive, and uh, people that harvest this will will temporarily drain that area, and they will carve maybe six inches or so off of the top, and then when they get done, the land is reflooded, and the peat goes grows back for several years before another harvest. So it's a renewable resource if it's handled right. But if you're of a mind that it's not a renewable resource and you kind of want things to be continually uh, nature, and that's your, uh, that's your uh, prerogative, an alternative to that, which gives similar properties, is a, pro is a substance called core, which is derived from coconut husk. And it can be some more difficult to work with with the peat, but it has some, some of the same benefits of the water holding capacity. Now, in the Red River Valley and other towns and cities in the in the clay part of the Red River Valley, that uh, that high clay soil uh, has um, has some problems with uh, drainage. It's really hard to get good drainage on these soils, so you may have to consider a raised bed strategy. So here's some examples that I gathered from the from the net on raised beds. And uh, if it's really long, like that one up on the upper left, then some cross bracing is probably a very good thing. I don't see any there, but it looks like those are pretty stout. What would they be? Two by two by two by tens, maybe twelve foot long or something like that. That's probably max. More more likely, if you're going to use boards like that, is is a smaller raised beds over in the lower right because they, they don't require as much cross bracing. These are ones that I did. I remember Lincoln Logs as a kid, and so, you know, why not? So I take uh, landscape timbers that don't have any harmful arsenic or anything in them, and uh, I just put them together with some metal stakes. And uh, the, the cucumbers are growing across that trellis in the middle. I'd make mine about 30 inches high so that we don't have to lean over too much. We certainly don't have to kneel down to do anything. They're very convenient. It takes some time to build, but once they're built, they last for about 10 years before you have to redo them, at least in our climate. So you can grow all kinds of things in them, uh, some spinach and some lettuce. Here's earlier in the season, the same same kind of beds. Uh, we're not, I'm not the person that uh, invented these things. We were over in China a few years ago, and, and this particular uh, hoop that went over this uh, for their gourds, and, uh, and they were very big. Uh, was somewhere around 300 feet long or so and around 16 feet high so it's it's a nice way to grow your vines air gets to them uh, they don't have as much problem with disease all right so how to till the garden if you're going to till it fall is really the time to till it uh, we have soils that kind of heal themselves over the time most of our soils do especially the high clays uh, so Tilling in the fall, by the time spring comes, the, the, the garden is 
pretty well good to go. If you take your hand uh, as the soil is drying, it's the, the soil becomes very loose because the, the clays shrink and swell and create little particles. So in the springtime, less, less tilling is, is better. So less is more. Uh, if you till a clay soil when it's too wet, and I've had experience with this first year, I was here in Fargo. Uh, if you till it too wet, you get clods. If you till it too dry, you get clods. You have to be out there like at 2 o'clock on the perfect day in order for it to do well. So uh, shallow tillage is really better than deep in those clay soils in the springtime. One of the things that's been a hit in these uh, presentations in the past has been these self-watering containers. You can find plans for this on the web, and I'm going to lead you through this really quickly. And again, you're going to have these pictures when we get done. So I'm going to go from start to finish and show you how to do these. Peppers really like this. Green peppers, red peppers, chili peppers. Um, there's, it's a, there's, a, there's a reason why New Mexico is really big in chilies, because because peppers love warm roots, and this is one way to get warm roots is in these self-watering containers. And you can leave these things for a week and uh, your plants won't dry out, which is really nice. So here are the tools you need. Why do you need that piece of plywood? I had a question last year. It's because do you really want to put holes in your grandmother's antique oak table? So that's why that piece of plywood is there. So when you're drilling holes, you're drilling into something that uh, you're not going to get yelled at. So you go to the big box store or your local hardware store and you get this uh, get this tub. They're around 15 gallon and they have a lid on them. And the lid's important because that's, that's going to be your dividing line. And they're mostly tapered from top to bottom and you want that because the what you cut out on the top is going to set down about halfway down in the middle. I'll show you in a minute. So the top, before you do any cutting, you drill a number of half inch holes like that across the top and that's going to let um, water move up into the soil and then you cut it out so that it lays about halfway down into the tub. So of course that the dividing line is not going to sit there by itself so you have to cut some three four inch diameter PVC pipe and uh, and mark the places that are very close to one of the holes that you drill because you want to drill holes in this and, and have the wire to attach the PVC to the bottom of the diaphragm uh, before you flip it over and it's ready to take soil. So here we are, we've, we've set it up and we've marked where the holes are going to be. And then we drill the holes, see how they're next to the holes on the diaphragm? That's what we want so you don't have to so the, so the wire is easily threaded through there. And then the wire threads through. You're cutting the wire about six, seven inches long or so. And then you're threading the wire through just like that. And then it goes into the hole in the diaphragm and you just tie it, tie it on. So when you get done, this is what it's going to look like. This is without it being laid into the tub, but, but you can see how how the PVC supports the diaphragm and the diaphragm is attached to the PVC by the wires that you've cut and threaded through both. Just like that. Then there's another hole that you that you cut and that's going to be for the fill pipe. See how the fill pipe is is cut at about a 45 degree, degree angle. That's so when you plunk it down into the tub, it doesn't plug. You, know, you need to make sure that it touches the bottom, but you need to make sure that that water is going to flow through it. And so that's why you cut it at 45, just like that. So here's the diaphragm. It's placed into the tub with the fill pipe into its little hole. And then uh, you're almost ready. Okay, so that's what it looks like. Okay, so also one more thing that you do is you, you have to cut a hole in one of those pipes, usually the middle one, but it really doesn't matter which one. But that's going to enable good soil to water contact when, when you uh, fill it up with soil and put the water in. So then you take a soil. I use this, but I'm not an endorser. You can use any kind of good garden soil that you want. 
and you fill it up and this is what it looks like when you get done. So you have the fill pipe, you have the soil, you have the soil panted down into that PVC pipe that you cut the hole into and then you fill it up with water and at the side, gosh you can just barely see it, and I'm not going to be able to point, but see on the left hand, on the left hand container, on the right hand side of it, about halfway down, you can see a little bit of a hole. You drill about an inch hole right at the level of where the diaphragm is. And so as you're pouring water into that, maybe once a week or once every three or four days, whenever you want, then that prevents the soil from being flooded. So you have water in the bottom, but you don't have excess water above the diaphragm. Any excess water drain, drains out that hole. And that way you know that it's filled to the level that it needs to be filled. So that's the last thing you do. All right, so moving on uh, for uh, people that have a high clay backyard like mine, this is my favorite mix. About a third of the volume of our high clay soils and about a third of the volume using some kids' clay sands, pretty coarse sand. And then about a third of the volume is sphagnum peat moss. And then you mix that all up, which is quite the job in a uh, raised bed, but, um, but it's a good exercise. You don't have to pay $20 a week to a gym. So, so that, that works. You mix very thoroughly before you plant it because you don't want those things layered or, or else, uh, your garden's not going to be very good. So you have to thoroughly mix that thing. And uh, maybe doing, doing it in the fall of the year is probably the best, uh, best thing, although I've done it in the spring also. Uh, and then soil mixes for containers that are not self-watering. You need to make sure you're going to contain, uh, get some potting, potting soil. You want to make sure that it contains about half, half the volume of peat moss or something similar because, unlike a garden, you're not going to have the luxury of, of uh, say, groundwater, excess water percolating up through a container. The container, that's, that's, that's the home. That's all you've got. And so you want to make sure that the soil will hold as much water as possible and, uh, and the peat moss or something like it will enable you to do that. And then drainage is also important. Don't use a pot that doesn't have a hole on the bottom. It needs to have drainage because you get a heavy rain or something like that. You're, you're just going to be trying, trying to grow a tomato in a fishbowl. It's not going to work. They have to have the air, remember. So, you know, the pots that are over there on the left, that's, that's what I do. I make sure that I have a, a good mix that has a significant amount of peat moss in it. It's because uh, the sun's going to bear down on that all day, 12, 14 hours in the summer. And, it, uh, and if all you have is just soil in there, uh, it's not going to take much to bake that out. And especially if you have really tall tomato plants like I do there on the left. <coughs> they take a lot of water too. So make sure that you have plenty of peat moss in there. Fertilizing, organic, inorganic, it's kind of up to you. I consider it a personal choice. Uh, Alan went into fertilizers to some degree. Whenever you're buying it, you're going to see a guaranteed analysis. 10, 10, 10 means the first number is always percent nitrogen, second number is percent phosphorus, third number is percent uh, potash, and if it has anything else, it also appears on the bag. <coughs> so a lot of people are, are used to fertilizing farm fields, and uh, it seems like that people put a lot of fertilizer on for for wheat or for corn or a lot of our crops, but but our vegetable crops are raised far more intensively than our field crops. And so although we really don't think about adding a lot of micronutrients and other nutrients to our, to our crops, we put a lot of pressure on our soils to grow uh, these vegetables. So, so using some type of um, what multi-nutrient fertilizer might fill in some gaps that we really normally don't need for for field cop cultivation so so consider that again i don't i'm not an endorser but that's just an example there's many fertilizers out there foliar sprays generally aren't needed for a garden if it's well fertilized uh, the exception of that would be uh, tomato uh, the 
uh, end, bl end, end blight on the tomatoes. That's uh, normally caused by in, inadequate watering. Uh, the person will, will water their tomatoes and it'll be okay for a day, but then they forget to do it the next day. And, and so this infrequent watering and uneven watering really affects tomatoes a lot. And uh, the reason it does is because calcium is really important in the seed coats of tomatoes and other fruits. And calcium moves through the plant through the transpiration stream. And if the plant is borderline wilting, uh, that's when you see these black spots. But uh, if you're really under intensive cultivation, uh, maybe a dilute spray of gypsum, which is calcium sulfate, might help this. But the regular system of watering is more most helpful, even though this is a calcium deficiency. The, the biggest problem that results in this is the unregular watering of the tomatoes. So I'm going to mention this because I need to mention this. And I mentioned it in that circular too. And we don't have a huge problem with this, but I would just want people to be aware. <coughs> we have some really good things about soils in the North Dakota. We have plenty of selenium in, in a lot of the state, which is a very healthy thing. But along with the selenium, we have this thing that um, uh, called cadmium, which is a heavy metal. And uh, some certain plants accumulate cadmium more than others. And there's a part of our state that has more plant available cadmium than any other. And that's the, it's kind of a triangle that starts at the north end of Devil's Lake and kind of what V's up. Uh, and it uh, encompasses Langdon, Walhalla. And so things to consider is if you're, you just have a garden in the backyard, it's not raised, it's native soil. Uh, leafy vegetables are going to be the ones that are most susceptible to cadmium. Now, if you you know if you just have a occasional lettuce sandwich and maybe a little spinach, it's really not going to be a big deal. But if you're a big canner, you freeze a lot, and this is where you get your broccoli, your cabbage, and and you eat this stuff every other day for a whole year, um, maybe that's not a good plan. Maybe the best plan would be to go to something like a raised bed, import some soil from outside of the region. And uh, then, then grow these susceptible things, the things that accumulate cadmium in, in a soil like that. So I'm just, I'm just saying, it's just so you can be aware. So with that, open it up for questions. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Dave. Yeah, of course, everybody's amazed by your pepper system there you got going on there. <laughs> now, how about? Uh, there's a question about do, do these uh, bell peppers, do they, do these tub systems, do you ever have problems with mosquitoes? No. No. They can't take the hot pepper. So. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, we used to have trouble with mosquitoes because Bush was around our patio, and the, and the answer to that was to make a screened in uh, addition. There you go. There you go. <laughs> How about do, do the plants get root bound in those tubs? No, the, the plants have never gotten root bound. Of course, you don't want to put six plants in there. I, I limit it to two healthy plants uh, spaced, uh, you know, evenly across. When I put the soil in, another thing that I do, and I didn't show that, I guess I should, but when I put the soil in, I put about half the soil in, and then, then I put a concentrated band of 10, 10, 10. So it's about, what, maybe four or five inches below where the soil surface is going to be. And then I put a little bit more soil, and then I put the plants in, and then I finish finish the soil around that. And that concentrated band of sort of fertilizer really gives them a nice boost when they start. But I never find them root bound at all. Um, and I use uh, I can use those containers. Well, they they've had a, a life of around five five years or so. Uh, after every year, I I clean them out so that any kind of contagion or something like that is washed out of that and that's ready to use again. I don't use the same soil from year to year. I, I dump it in another garden patch and, uh, and I put in fresh soil the next time. Is that a general recommendation of yours when in containers to start with new soil every year? Yes. Yeah. Not, not so much for the fertility because that's not the issue. The issue is, is some of the diseases that might propagate in the in the pots over time. 
How about, uh, you know, you mentioned cadmium. Are there symptoms of uh, cadmium poisoning? What, maybe even in plants? Can you tell if the plant is loaded with cadmium? How, how do we be cautious around this? Yeah, so so any kind of a fruit crop is not a problem. Cadmium doesn't uh, accumulate to any degree in things like tomatoes and cucumbers and things like that. It's only the, the green leafy tissues like spinach and especially the broccolis and cauliflower and those those kind of plants that, that, that are a problem. So I wouldn't worry about any kind of fruit crop, uh, sweet corn, anything like that. But um, if, if, if you're into those uh, green leafy vegetables, then uh, just as a precaution, I, I would consider a raised bed with some imported soil. There is a soil test for cadmium, right? There is. Um, yeah, a, a lab like AgVice could probably do that. What the critical level is, I'm not really sure. One of the, in other parts of the state, I don't think it's an issue. It's an issue up in that area because the soils are so shallow from the surface to the shale layer. Uh, and the shale is what, the, the ancient shale that underlines almost all of North Dakota is the source of cadmium and when you if you're in that area and, and you till a garden you'll see these little pieces of of gray flaky rocks that's the shale and that's where the cadmium comes from it has some some nice agronomic uh, uh, properties because it also contains uh, mineralizable nitrogen and our nitrogen fertilizer recommendations are less up there just because the soil acts like a slow release fertilizer but it but it also has an unfortunate uh, property of having some cadmium there's no um, plants uh, at, at any kind of levels we have in the state anywhere uh, they don't exhibit uh, cadmium toxicity at all i mean something like that would have to be right outside of a chinese battery factory or something how about uh can a person use slough water, slough, S-L-O-U? Slew water. Slew water, I'm sorry. Can a person use slew water for watering when the rainwater contained systems run dry? Um, yeah, I think you can. Uh, to If it's in a, let me see. If a person knows because of maybe some of the vegetation around the slough, uh, has some salt influences. I mean, you can see sometimes the white effervescence or a lot of foxtail barley or kosher, mm -hmm. something like that growing around it, then I'd be reluctant to do it. But if you don't see anything like that, you can test the water. It's not expensive to test the water for salts. And if it looks like the salt content is fairly low, then there's no problem with using it. Okay, here's a long question. Stay with me. Page two of that publication indicates that well aggregated soils with bright yellow subsoil are indicators of a well aerated subsoil yes this person's never seen bright yellow soil in fargo no evidently they're enchanted by it where do you where can we find that um go uh let me see so where would you go so go west of fargo uh, about uh, 40 miles and you'll come to uh, a ridge with a windmill, <laughs> the windmill on that? top of it. <laughs> well, I worked in that area quite a bit. Okay. And as soon as you get out of the valley, as soon as you get out of the valley, then then a lot of the a lot of the hilltop side slope positions have that kind of soil. Yeah. How about? I don't know. You can handle this one, but let me ask you, what's your opinion on trimming back vegetation when fruit, maybe like your peppers, are ripening? They get a lot of leaf growth, and it just breaks the plant. Yeah, so, yeah, my those, those pepper plants become pepper trees in some years, and so I have to watch that. So, so what I do to prevent that is to maybe harvest a little bit early or... I mean, it, it, it's sinful. Here we are in March, and we're hoping for the first tomato. But, but sometimes you know, thinning back a cluster of five tomatoes to maybe two right. to avoid those kind of things is something that you have to do. You know, in Taiwan, we would stake every pepper plant. 
we stake them. Just use a bamboo stake. Oh, I do. Yeah, yeah I so stake them. Yeah, that should help if you just provide some support for the plants. Yes. Yeah, you don't want to. You don't want to have the plants fall over. We we stake right. up all our tomatoes. We stake up all of our peppers. Okay. Uh, last chance for any questions. I, did Sue have a question that she wanted to type in? Okay, let's, we're going to cut it off there. Dave, thank you for your You're welcome. about swells. It's always good to have you here at the Spring Fever Forum. Thank, thank you. you. Well, we're going to take a, another quick five-minute break, and we're going to move on to Prairie Meadows, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>